Okay, let's uh, look at our Bibles. Our scripture will be 1 Kings chapter 18 and verses 21 through 46. First Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. And Elijah came and all the people and said, How long call ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under and I will dress the other bullock and lay it on one and put no fire under and call ye on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire let him be God and all the people answered and said it is well spoken and Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, and put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning, even until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god, either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth, and must be awake. And they cried aloud, and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances, till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass, when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he prepared the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, and whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he built and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullet in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, unto, and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran down about the altar and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. And Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea, and he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And he said, Go well, again seven times. And, he came to, and it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. 
And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance to Jezreel. As we continue looking at this verse, I uh, want us to think about certainly the example Elijah had in challenging these false prophets and the responsibility we have as believers to challenge those who would teach false things and who would be false prophets too or who would falsely lead this nation in a way that's not according to righteousness. We need to, we need to do that. But I've I mentioned this before, but... I might ask, and, and we'll just stop and, and think for, for a moment. What do we have in the book of Ephesians? Why are we given armor? Why is it, does it say there that we're given armor? And the different pieces of armor that we have. Because we're in a struggle. We're in a battle. We're fighting for righteousness. We're fighting for God's holy and infallible word. And we want to uphold that. And so we want to go out with the things that God has given to equip us and we might go out in these battles and stand faithfully and stand for the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. We also say, uh, why, is, why does Paul instruct fight the good fight of faith? Why is that instruction there? Because there's a fight. There's a struggle out there in which we need to engage. And just as uh, Elijah faced these prophets of Baal. Can you imagine the odds? 450 to 1. And it's just 1 to nothing. And it's God against the prophets of Baal. But anyway, 450 of them there. And, uh, and once again, we, and we've mentioned this before, we just try to picture these guys yelling and, uh, and, and Elijah in a very mocking way. He says, maybe he's asleep. Maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's gone somewhere. Maybe he's on a journey. And he can't hear you. And so we've read, you know, what took place. But where, where else in Scripture um, that we're told to be a, a faithful soldier of the Lord? Why is the word soldier used? Because there's a struggle and there's a battle there and there's truth uh, for which we ought to stand and to never, never give up, never yield ground. And as we were talking about this portion of scripture in a parable this morning in Sunday school, but occupy, it says, till I come. Till Jesus Christ comes again, we occupy and we, we occupy the land uh, and spread the gospel and want to see people to come to saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he said, we had seen and heard that uh, there were Bibles being burned last night in one of those towns there in the western part of the country and, uh, and all this mob of people they're setting fire on the Bible and uh, we we ought to certainly pray against them and uh, and pray for protection for believers and uh, some of you remember uh, Dan Goodwin I was uh, talking to him last night we talked about once a month or more and uh, anyway he said he just can't believe it's gotten as bad as it is over there he said he wants to get out of here so quickly. He said they they would move. Average, it's not so bad, you know. We can say that, but I don't know if she would fall for that. But anyway, they're talking about moving right away. So uh, anyway, pray for Dan, and he's uh, he's still doing machinery work, machining, and uh, and. Uh, running a lathe and so on, help makes parts for Boeing. And so we hope you'll uh, keep him in your prayers and keep his family in your prayers too. Whether, you know, and we, we can look at a lot of places in Scripture, that passage that we have in the book of Jude, uh, where we're told, contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And we're told that in Jude. And eventually we will get past that part of Scripture as we've been looking at the uh, epistle of, of Jude. 
And uh, but anyway, so contend for the faith. And that word contend, it comes from the Greek, like Olympic games that they had. And that was the word that was used to describe wrestling. And, uh, and so there's a wrestling, there's a battle, there's an ongoing uh, battle in which we find ourselves. But we're to contend for that faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And just many, many places that we can look at. And I know in the, uh, the, the book, Least Word Study, and in, in a section there, it's got uh, all the different references that relate to fighting or soldier or battle and so on. And he's got that in there. So it's just amazing to see this. And we think of that in relationship to the setting here. Elijah had no hesitancy, but to challenge the prophets of Baal, he had no hesitancy. Well, I'm one person, there are 450, and, uh, and it reminds me of the song, Who's on the Lord's Side? And, and Elijah was on the Lord's side. And so he was confident of the Lord's strength. I mentioned before, too, and I uh, just want to mention this. And this is a, a book, Contending for Our All. And it's Defending Truth and Treasuring Christ in the Lives of Athanasius, John Owen, and J. Grisham Machen. Athanasius. I mentioned him before, and I don't know if you remember. Um, he later had the nickname Contra Mundum, against the world, against the world. And he fought for doctrinal truth. He fought for that uh, particular cause for almost 50 years before it was finally agreed to that what he was saying was proper that he had been a bishop uh, for many long years in Egypt. He became the bishop of Alexandria in uh, 328. He was 30 years old, and he died in 373 at the age of 75. And one man wrote, I say he was viewed by the people as their bishop during these years because Athanasius was driven out of his church and office five times by the powers of the Roman Empire. 17 of his 45 years as bishop were spent in exile, but the people never acknowledged the validity of the other bishops sent to take his place. He was always bishop in exile as far as his flock was concerned. So because he stood for the truth, and he battled for the truth, and his nickname was Contra Mundum, and, and it, would we have that reputation in our own lives? They were against the world in standing the worldly standards and that we would uphold the truth of God's word. I know one man wrote about Athanasius. Uh, let one praise him in his fastings and prayers. Another, his awareness, his unweariedness and zeal for vigils and somnity. Another, his patronage of the needy. Another, his dauntlessness towards the powerful and his condescension to the lowly. He was to the unfortunate, their constellation, the hoary headed, their staff, youth, their instructors, the poor, their resource, the wealthy, their steward, even the widow's will, praise their protector, even the orphans, their father, even the poor, their benefactor, strangers, their entertainer, brethren, the man of brotherly love, the sick, their physician. Or how he was described in his years as being their bishop. One of the things that makes this kind of praise from contemporaries, from a contemporary setting, it's even more credible that, and like many of the ancient saints, Athanasius is not recorded as, not, as having done any miracles. No recording of that. A man had written about Athanasius' work, and it's in a, like a 50, 40 volume set. The um, anti nice anti nicene and the post nicene church fathers that says of him he surrounded by an atmosphere of truth not a single miracle of any kind is related of him the saintly reputation of Athanasius rested on his life and character alone without the aid of any reputation for miraculous power then he goes on with his own praise of Athanasius so we need to have people who would, be, who would be reminded 
and uh, we won't take the time in getting about with uh, J. Gresham Machen, who was uh, forced out of the Presbyterian Church USA because he refused to abandon the Independent Board for Presbyterian Farm Missions, which was an independent ma mission agency. And the powers that be of the apostate PCUSA had instructed the Presbyterians to force these men uh, to, to leave the Independent Board for Presbyterian Farm Missions because it wasn't approved by the uh, by the denomination. Praise God it wasn't. They didn't need to seek the approval of apostates. Who would want that? And uh, instead, uh, they had established that. And so, but, but uh, Dr. Machen traveled all over the country speaking about this struggle that was going on all over the country. And as we said, and he died there, I think it was in North Dakota, uh, early in January, uh, when he had taken a train trip there. And he, ne he never was married, so he was always on the road, always traveling, always speaking different places. And, uh, and he was faithful unto the end. And the end came when he came down with a very bad case of pneumonia there and, and went to be with the Lord. And uh, so we rejoice in his testimony. And you can read in the, uh, in the written record of his uh, ecclesiastical trial. Uh, they, those that persecuted him and, and went after him, uh, they did not budge one inch. That's the only time they stood for something. But anyway, they didn't budge one inch, you know, to take into consideration the things that Dr. Machen said. But anyway, they persecuted him. They persecuted him severely. Well, you know, Elijah. Elijah was another man whom God had raised up. And he said, as we read in 1 Kings chapter 18, in verse 22, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. The Baal's prophets were 450 men. Pretty good odds. Pretty, pretty good odds. And, uh, and the Lord certainly strengthened him, and the prophets of Baal ended up just like committing Harry Carey on their, on their altar and uh, bleeding and stabbing themselves and so on. And destruction came. But the scripture says, and, and this speaks of Elijah, the righteous are as bold as a lion. The righteous are as bold as a lion. And uh, we ask ourselves today, does that boldness describe our stand for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ? Does that boldness describe our standing and having done all stand in this wicked day, does that, being bold as lion, does that describe our contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the, sa unto the saints? Does that give a description of it? Well, it certainly gives us a description of Elijah. And he was undeterred by any difficulties and uh, the numbers which stood against him. And that uh, place in Scripture in Romans chapter 8, we mentioned this um, in one of the earlier messages. But in Romans 8, 31, where we read there, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Boy, what a blessing that is. If God be for us, and you know in Greek, there's these Greek clauses, and uh, it just says if, someone might say, well, you know, there's four different causes that start with the word if, and, and it's possible, probable, probable, and, and so on about where they took place. And this was for sure, you know, that this was the case. Uh, if God be for us, and he is, and he is. And Elijah can, can say, if God be for us, and he was. As it says here in Romans, when Paul wrote, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who is it? Who is it against whom we stand? And it doesn't matter, as one man wrote, it matters not who be against them, for the battle is his. That is, the battle is God's battle, and it's not their own personal battle. It's God's battle, and he works in those whom he's raised up for that particular need. Out of the 450 prophets assembled on the mount that day, Elijah was the only one 
on the side of Jehovah. He was the only one. And you try to picture that scene and uh, imagine that uh, setting. And But anyway, the, what uh, an interesting thing about challenge. The prophets of Baal, Baal worship included the worship of fire. Baal was known for fire. And so I think probably the, the deal with Moloch, you know, when they put the babies in the hands of these idols and uh, they laid them, the hands reach out like that, then they would set fire underneath them and burn them up right there on the spot. And uh, that was all tied in with part of their Baal worship. And the thing about it is that these people, you know, tied in with like Baal was their fire god. And they couldn't get a flicker out of him. They couldn't get one thing to burn that he had started a fire for for them. And uh, the devil, we might say, the devil has always had the majority on his side. He always has. But we're on the Lord's side. We're on the Lord's side. And we've seen that in one of our songs. Who's on the Lord's side? And, uh, and Elijah was on the Lord's side. He was one person. 450 were on the other side. They were serving Baal. It's a, an encouragement to us that truth can't be judged by the numbers of people that support it. Truth can't be judged by the numbers of the people who support it. Here it was Athanasius. You know, for five decades, struggling over this matter of doctrine uh, in, in regard to the deity of Christ and, and in regard and have impact upon the understanding of the Trinity. For five decades, pursuing this. Never did a miracle. Never did anything like that. But in his pursuit of truth, he was on the Lord's side. And if we're on the Lord's side and we take his holy and infallible word and use that as our sword, uh, we know that eventually that we'll have victory according to the grace of God. We might ask ourselves, what percentage of, one man asked, what percentage of present day preachers are uncompromisingly proclaiming the truth? And among them, how many practice what they preach? We've said before that within a group called neo-evangelicalism, that are those when uh, in just understanding the word evangelicalism basically holding to uh, salvation by grace alone through faith alone, through Christ alone and that was the evangelical message but that's not what's there today that's not what's there today and uh, many of them are compromising on these, uh, on these perverted uh, sexual practices and uh, wanting to ordain them, wanting to have them as members in their church or, or having acceptance of them and it's going on and on and on and you might keep this in prayer particularly. I know that there are quite a number of people who in the PCA church ministers who have inquired about the Bible Presbyterian church and, and becoming a part of it because they're going to leave the PCA. I mean they see the handwriting on the wall, they would have been over but now except their senate was canceled too this summer. So they didn't need to. They didn't get to see any more handwriting on the wall, but they can they can see it in proclamations that come out of these places, especially at PCA Church in in St. Louis that led this convention or or series of meetings that they had that promoted the acceptance of homosexuality, and uh, so you know we ought to get that man's name and address and photocopy the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and just send it to him, you know, and flood him with that. But, you know, where would we be? Where would we be and if we couldn't sing about being on the Lord's side? Where would we be? We'd just be a part of the world and, and walk in, in that direction? Would that be where we would want to be? Not at all. Not at all. But Elijah and Athanasius and Dr. Machen and, and Dr. McIntyre and others who were faithful to God's word, who fought the good fight of faith and paid for it dearly in regard to uh, their being 
kicked out of, of the uh, PCUSA. They were removed, and uh, they were told, you have to obey the word of men. You have to obey the word of men. They said, we will obey God. We will not obey the word of men. And they were removed from the ministry, faithful, faithful to the gospel. And uh, and that's a little bit of the story, you know, with uh, Dr. McIntyre's church. He had a beautiful, beautiful stone building there in Collinswood, and they had to, they walked out of it. And uh, the only thing they took out of the church, they took the pulpit Bible. If it's like this one here, I hope it wasn't very far down the street where they had to go with it. But anyway, they the only thing that they uh, took out or probably were allowed to take out was was the Bible, and they had to have men circle the pulpit to guard Dr. McIntyre while he preached. And uh, it, it's a very bad thing. And they, and they walked down the street a few blocks to where they had bought par- property, and they put up a big tent, and it was kind of like a stereotype, but they were sawdust on the ground, and uh, they were set up there, and uh, and they went down there, they had paper cups for communion, and they had communion down there, and that was their start. That was their start. And they fought the good fight of faith. They didn't compromise with neo-evangelicalism, but many people, as we've mentioned before, uh, are deteriorating, and it's a, it's a weakening for the church, but it's a call for us to uh, stand for the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and be faithful to God's Word. Be faithful, and uh, don't, don't give up the fight. And may all the glory be given to God. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for this time together. We're thankful for your Word. We pray that we'll be faithful soldiers of the cross. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.